little kids, you're familiar with this song. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart to stay. Some of you don't have the joy in your heart this morning. In this trouble-filled world of ours, it sounds strange to a lot of people. But it really is possible for Christians to live with an inner sense of joy in life. I'm not talking about acting or pretending to be happy when you're really not. Some of the most successful comedians in Hollywood have lived tragically sad lives. I'm thinking of Lou Costello if you go way, way back, or more recently, Robin Williams. I mention that to say that it's possible to pretend to be happy even when you're living with despair. But God tells us in His Word that it's really possible for Christians to have an inner joy that life's difficulties and problems cannot quench. And Paul's letter to the Philippians is one of the notable books in the Bible that has a lot to say about the Christian's inner joy. In fact, in the four chapters of this short letter, Paul talks about rejoicing or having joy in the Lord more than a dozen times. I'll just share a couple of verses with you. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 1, Paul says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For, for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. And then in chapter 4 and in verse 4, Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say, rejoice. Well, I think one of the things that makes these words of Paul so significant is that when he wrote this letter, there were several things going on in his life that could have made him miserable, things that make many people today miserable. Let me remind you that he had been the target of an assassination conspiracy when he went to Jerusalem at the end of his third missionary journey. Remember that on his journey to Rome, he suffered shipwreck. And after getting to Rome, he is chained day and night to a Roman soldier. As a result of that, his public preaching was necessarily curtailed. And he was going to have to stand trial before Caesar for his very life. And all over the Roman Empire, his Jewish countrymen despised him and hated him, viewing him as a traitor to his people. There were even some preachers in Rome who envied Paul and tried to make things harder for him. Paul talks about that in Philippians chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, when he says, Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my chains. So what I'm saying to all of us this morning is that there were a number of things in Paul's life that could have caused him to be despondent and discouraged and downhearted, but Paul had an inner joy as a Christian. 
and he's writing to the saints in Philippi to urge them to rejoice in the Lord. In Philippians, I think Paul talks about four different attitudes that can make lasting joy possible in our lives. But before I mention those four attitudes, I want to mention four things that can rob us of joy. And one of those things, of course, is distressing circumstances. It's natural to feel good when everything's going well and going our way, but we all understand that many times in life there are circumstances, unpleasant circumstances, that we just can't control. Now that means that if a person's happiness is dependent upon ideal circumstances, he's going to be unhappy much of the time. In the second place, there are times when other people can rob us of joy. I'm sure all of us have experienced unhappiness, perhaps even depression, because of what other people have said to us or done to us. Is there any way to have inner joy despite other people? Well, Paul tells us there is. And then sometimes people's joy is robbed or taken from them because of their concern about material things. We're often robbed of joy because we don't have what we want. And Have you noticed that there are times in our life, even when we get what we want, what we've longed for a long time, those things don't live up to our expectations? Some of you who can remember back to the 60s may remember the TV commercials about two, uh, well, I guess they were dolls, (laughs) For, for kids, and me and my brother wanted Johnny West and Chief Cherokee and their horse, Thunderbolt. Anybody remember Johnny West, Chief Cherokee, and Thunderbolt? I guess I'm age, or dating myself. Well, we got Johnny West and Chief Cherokee and Thunderbolt for Christmas one year. But, you know, after we got that, they just didn't quite live up to our expectations. That's the way it is with life, isn't it? Well, there's a fourth thing that can steal our joy. And, of course, that's worry about the future. Now, I've mentioned all of that because, as I've already said, I think there are four attitudes discussed in the book of Philippians that can trip, can contribute to this inner joy. The secret to joy and the way that Paul was able to have this sense of inner joy is because he had the right attitude towards circumstances and people and things and the future. Of course, it should be obvious to each one of us that if we have the right attitude towards these four things, then they can't rob us of our inner joy. If we will develop the right attitude towards these four things, then we will be enabled to live lives of joy despite our our circumstances, despite what other people might say or do to us despite 
whatever things we have or don't have, and despite whatever the future might bring. And so the four attitudes for joy that we want to think about for the next few minutes are these. Paul shows us that one of the secrets to abiding joy in spite of difficult circumstances is putting Christ first in our life. Notice what Paul says in verse 21 of chapter 1. He says, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, this is a very simple and yet a very important point. The reason that circumstances didn't rob Paul of his inner joy because he was not living to enjoy circumstances, he was living to serve Christ. That's why, as he tells us in Ephesians 3, verse 1, he didn't think of himself as being a prisoner of Rome, but rather a prisoner of Christ Jesus. And that's why he didn't think of himself as facing a civil trial, but rather being appointed for the defense of the gospel. Look at what he says in verse 17 of Philippians 1. But the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. So you see, the Apostle Paul wasn't living his life merely to enjoy pleasant circumstances. And because he wasn't living his life in that way, the circumstances that he faced couldn't rob him of his joy as a Christian. We don't have to wonder about what was important to the Apostle Paul because he tells us what was important. In the first 11 verses of Philippians 1, and we can't take the time to read those verses, but in that section, Paul tells us that he was concerned about the fellowship of the gospel. And then in verses 12 through 26, he shows us that he was concerned about the furthering of the gospel. There were individuals preaching Christ with the wrong motives, out of envy, trying to make things harder for Paul. Now, Paul didn't approve of those attitudes, but he rejoiced that Christ was being preached. And then in verses 27 through 30, he shows us that he's concerned about the faith of the gospel. Here's my point. Because Paul was single-mindedly living for Christ, he could look at his circumstances not as personal problems and become depressed about that, but as avenues to magnify Christ. Now what makes this personal and practical for us today is that it can work for us as well. If we will change our attitude from living merely to enjoy circumstances to rather using our circumstances, whatever that they might be, to magnify Christ, to exalt Him, then we can have this inner joy. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul shows us that one of the secrets to abiding joy in spite of difficult people is developing a submissive Christ-like attitude toward others. There's an interesting contrast between Philippians chapter 1 and chapter 2. Chapter 1 shows us that we need to put Christ first in our life. Philippians chapter 2 shows us that we need to put other people second. And furthermore, 
Philippians chapter 2 gives us four actual examples of people who did that very thing. Individuals who put other people before themselves. In the first 11 verses of Philippians chapter 2, Jesus is the classic illustration of someone who did that very thing. Notice what Paul says in verse 3 and verse 4. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And then he says in verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then Paul went on to talk about how Christ left heaven and he came and he was obedient to God, even to the point of death, even the death of the cross. In verses 12 through 18, Paul cites himself as an example of someone who put others before himself. Notice what he says in verse 17. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. How could Paul say something like that? Well, he could say that because the Philippians were more important to him than himself. And then in verses 19 and 20, Paul cites Timothy as an example of someone who put others before himself. He says, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state, for I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state, for all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Timothy was someone who put others above himself. And then finally, in verses 25 through 30, Paul mentions Epaphroditus. He says in verse 30, because for the work of Christ, he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. Why is it that other people often rob us of joy? Well, isn't it, isn't it because they often keep us from getting or doing what we want? I think if we're really honest with ourselves, we're going to have to admit that that is the case. People sometimes rob us of joy because they keep us from getting what we want. I just remembered that story in the Old Testament about King Ahab who coveted Naboth's vineyard. And Naboth refused to sell the vineyard, and as a result, Ahab was all down in the dumps and depressed and discouraged and sullen, and, and he told his wife about it, and you remember the rest of the story. Sometimes other people rob us of joy because they keep us from getting what we want. But you see, our focus is on ourselves too much. What would happen if we developed the kind of Christ-like submissiveness that seeks to serve other people instead of expecting others to serve us? Well, I think the answer is obvious. It would enable us to have joy from serving instead of unhappiness because we're not being served. Whatever steps we take toward developing a Christ-like submissive attitude towards others will be an important step 
towards living more joyful lives. Well, then in the third place, Paul shows that one of the secrets of abiding joy in spite of things is replacing a carnal and materialistic attitude with a more spiritual attitude. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul uses the word things over and over again. In verse 7 and 8 and verse 13 and verse 19. And in verse 19, he reminds us that although many people seek earthly things, we ought to be spiritually minded and focus on, on, on heavenly things instead. Look at Philippians 3, verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. What would happen in our lives if we really began to look at the things of this world from heaven's viewpoint? What would happen if we began to view things as merely tools to help us serve the Lord rather than be comfortable, for example? Well, I think the answer is obvious. If we really broke free from being possessed by our possessions, we would find one of the secrets of lasting joy. Well, finally, may I mention that Paul shows us that one of the secrets of abiding joy in spite of worry is developing a trusting attitude. Trusting God fully and completely will help us have what Paul calls the peace of God. Actually, there's three interesting contrasts or three interesting ideas in the context of Philippians 3 verse 7. Notice in verse 6 and 7, Paul talks about, or right, I'm chapter 4, excuse me, Paul talks about right praying. He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So in those two verses, he talks about the right kind of praying. Notice in verse 8, he talks about the right kind of thinking. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And then in verse 9, he talks about right living. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. Please notice especially how verses 6 and 7 connect right praying with developing a trusting attitude toward God that can drive worry out of our lives. So outlook really can determine outcomes when you're talking about whether or not you're living your life with an abiding joy that God can give Christians. 
who are walking with him and living faithfully. If we will cultivate single-minded devotion to Christ and a submissive attitude towards others and a spiritual attitude toward friends and a secure and trusting attitude in contrast to worry, we really can have the kind of joy that Paul urged the Philippians to have. We really can have a peace that passes understanding. Well, before I close this morning, I I do want to mention one thing that can offset uh, all of this. And of course, that's the consciousness of unforgiving sin in our life. If we're aware that we've sinned against God and that sin has not been forgiven by God because we have not turned from it and we have not sought God's forgiveness according to His will, then we're not going to have this sense of abiding joy. Of course, the good news is that we don't have to live with guilt and God's condemnation. We can be forgiven. The blood of Christ is there to wash all of our sins away. And the psalmist tells us that when God forgives us, he removes our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. You just can't get any further away than that. I think it was Michael who said that God cast our iniquities into the depths of the sea. And so let me urge you that if you know that there's unforgiven sin in your life, it will that knowledge will rob you of joy, but you can take care of that. You can be forgiven through the blood of